You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, we are back in the studio. I um, just want to give a quick update because we haven't given anyone an update on like what we've been doing in a while. Well, how do we summarize it? <laughs> um, well, yeah. So, I mean, just a few things. Uh, since the last time, we, since the last show, because um, we do record these in big chunks, mm-hmm. uh, as many as we can get fit into a weekend um, without just exhausting ourselves. Uh, Emily's been, uh, you know, to Muskogee. Well, she's she lives near in the Muskogee Tahlequah area, but she's moved from OK, which is in that area, to on oh, one side of the area, uh, one side of that, yeah, one side, <laughs> and then basically you've jumped over the lake, pretty much, uh, <laughs> and gone to <laughs> gone to Tahlequah, uh, moved the camper over there. She's now living with our other sister. Um, well, not with, but has the camper on their property. Which yeah, is pretty nearby. Cool. It's like the world's biggest house. Because we just kind of have combined households and yeah, yeah, it, it's been interesting, but we work well together, so it's good. And yeah, yeah. So there, so that's cool. Um, you also got some really great news. Getting a grandson, and I'm really excited about that because there's not a lot of boys in our family, and so this is this is good because you were like the only one in your our generation, and then we have one nephew. Yeah. So it, it'll be yeah, good so to kind of even out the ratio there. Gonna have a great <laughs> nephew. Yeah. To go with my great niece. Yeah. Well, this is always a good thing. So, and, and grandkids are so much better than kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, something else that's cool that's going on, um, November 1st, you've been invited to do a Skype Q&A session mm-hmm. over Scandalous. Yeah. Uh, there's been a, a women's Bible study group there that's been using it kind of as a, a textbook, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. It's awesome. And um, so that's great. Um, got an invitation there. Yeah. And we are available if anyone ever wants to do Skype Q&As with us, if anybody ever wants to have us uh, do speaking engagements. Mm-hmm. Um, we're good with that. Um, yeah. Just and Nathan can do music. <laughs> and I can do music. Um, just, but yeah, we're, we'll be glad to do that. Um, really, all we ask is you feed us and get us there. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Provide us a warm place to sleep. <laughs> we'll do just about anything. Uh, for food, I've, I've under, uh, uh, Scooby so I've, snacks, no, our no, weakness. <laughs> no, so I've, been, I've been listening to Tim Mackey and he's been talking about Christian disciplines. And he said, there's, he goes, there's two, uh, opposing Christian disciplines. Um, that he starts a series and he's like, there's two opposing Christian disciplines I'm going to talk about tonight. And he goes, one is fe- one is fasting and one is feasting. And I thought I'm really good at one of those. <laughs> right. So, uh, <laughs> me, um, but yeah, so yeah, we will, we'll come feast with you wherever. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, but, um, uh, but that's pretty cool. And then, uh, I just want to throw this out real quick. I know it's a bit early, but I'm gonna throw just a little teaser. We've got something else in the works for the Raven Creek, uh, social club productions. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm super excited about it. We don't have it. I mean, we, we've, we don't have the schedule yet. But we are thinking uh, in we January have... we're going to have it launched. So be on the lookout. Go visit the page sometime. You might see some indicators of what's coming. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't. We I, have I don't all, get... Well, we have all the commitments from people who matter. Yes. So... <laughs> we have the, yes, we have the commitments. Um, we found someone who's willing to edit it or actually... Uh, there's, there's a person, a clue. <laughs> there's a person who someone else found someone who's willing to do the editing on it. So that was my main reservation is I, I could not take on any more show editing uh, than I'm already doing. And so that was the last piece of the puzzle as far as I was concerned to make it happen. And yeah, that's, I think that's all I want to say <laughs> um, because I don't want to give too much away, but I, I'm excited and be, I think it's going to be good. Be on the lookout. So something that's, totally different from what we've got going on right now. It, it's yeah, so, fair, fairly different, and yeah. So it's going to that. be interesting. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, we might tell mm-hmm. some of the people in the paddle store what it's about, but yeah, but you have to ask. Oh, and there might be a new member coming to the paddle store because of that. So also true. So yeah. So, 
anyway, uh, <laughs> so that being said, I'm like I said, I'm super excited. I don't want to give away anymore. I, I should stop talking about it. <laughs> so let's talk about. Um, but oh, anyway, so I'm gonna wrap that up first, though. So that's just quick update of what we have been doing and what we are gonna be doing. Um, a little bit of it. <laughs> a little bit of it. Yeah, that's just a, a short snippet. And then you also throw in uh, on my side work and raising kids. Um, and then on Emily's side, uh, hanging out with the, all the, all the running, all the running. Yeah. All yeah. the running that's involved with taking care of family. <laughs> so yeah. that's basically my full-time job now. So, yeah. So anyway, but let's, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, I think we were in judges 11 mm-hmm. starting in verse 12. So we're going to, uh, yeah, I we're going to start there. <laughs> so Emily has been vigorously researching while I have been you've been editing editing so, so uh, yeah <laughs> but yeah uh you know we left off with um last time with Jephthah being called and offered this position of leadership in Israel and he was basically brought in to defeat the Ammonites and it's kind of interesting how he goes about it because he doesn't begin by you know, assembling an army, he begins by actually going into negotiations. Mm -hmm. And this was so hard to research because what Jephthah's doing here is, it's just, it's so insane. And so we're going to kind of walk through it point by point because I had to take it apart in order to understand what's going on here. I think the first thing we need to notice is he is addressing the king of Amnon as an equal. Mm -hmm. And so he's really setting himself up as the king of Israel again. So we're seeing this continued, uh, this continued situation where judges could accidentally slip into that role of a king or even purposely slip into a role of Mm -hmm. a king. And that's, that's really being continued here. And when you think about who he is, we looked at that a lot with uh, Gideon's son, right? Gideon, uh, Abimelech, and that really came to the forefront. Mm Mm-hmm. But then you've got Jephthah, who, when you look at his roots, I mean, he's the son of a prostitute who was driven out of his home. Mm-hmm. Is this really a man you want ruling over Israel? And, and I'm not, you know, take that out of today's context, put it back into the ancient context. Is, is that someone who has the right pedigree for it? Right. And so that's not me talking. That That's trying to put myself into that original context of the audience. Right. Because right. you've got to have the right family. That's just how it works. And so he sends out these Malachim or, or messengers. And basically this is like ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So he's even saying, I have the people who function in a Royal court setting. And again, right there on on level uh, at the same level as the King of Amnon. And it begins this whole exchange and it's got posing, it's got posturing, it's got revisionist history, we've got rhetorical questions. Yeah, it's it's really, it, it's kind of an interesting exchange. Well, it, it's it's bluffing. Um, it, it Basically, if you want to know what this sounded like, turn on any one of the presidential debates that you might be able to listen to. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it really does. Yeah, it has that feel of like, well, your people did this, but our people didn't. I'm not as bad as you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the whole lesser of two evils debate. Well, and I think it kind of shows that one of the things we saw beginning with, with Gideon when he talked to the Ephraimites uh, after the battle, and they're like, you know, you didn't call us into battle. Why weren't we included? And, and Gideon began that very political speak. Mm-hmm. And so we're seeing this rise of politics and political correctness, if you will, as the theology is declining. Yeah. and. If that's not a warning, I don't know what is <laughs> a lesson to be learned from Jephthah. So it, the, the king of Amnon, he opens up with a bluff. I mean, just right out the gate. He he does not. Um, he doesn't even try to hide what he's doing. He's basically counting on Jephthah not being familiar enough with history in order to have any kind of response. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, basically, you took this land from us when y'all came out of Egypt. You took it away from us. We want it back. And then Jephthah, and you, know, you got to remember, this is all taking place between, with messengers. None of them are, they are not speaking face to face. Right. Jephthah does not 
feel like he has to go meet the king of Amnon because the king of Amnon is, if he goes to him, then he's saying that the king of Amnon is greater. So by keeping this, um, this conversation carried on between messengers, then we're still seeing that maintaining of we're equals. And so he refutes this, this argument by basically kind of recounting how things really happened, kind of. But he, he begins to, to explain the journey. So we got to kind of go back and look at the journey. So the most direct route to Canaan, if you leave Egypt, is through the countries of Edom and Moab. Mm-hmm. So when the Israelites got to Edom, Moses, he sends messengers to the Edomite king and asks for passage through the land. And the Edomites, you know, they're family because they're, they're the descendants of Esau. Mm-hmm. So they're related through the Jacob Esau connection. And there's a presumption of goodwill from, right. from Moses. You know, hey, you know, you're going to help us out because we're cousins. Yeah. And, and God even told them to be nice to the Edomites. Yes. That's Deuteronomy 2.5. And he says, don't, don't fight with them. And so when the Edomites said, hey, no, you can't come through here, they, they went around. Mm-hmm. And so then the, the children of Israel go to Moab. And again, God says, I gave the land to Moab. Don't fight with them. The Moabites don't let the, the children of Israel go through their land. That's Deuteronomy 2.9. But then 38 years pass. Mm -hmm. And during this time, they pass by the Ammonites at, you know, 38 years later. And God tells them, don't fight with the Ammonites. Right. Because their family, because Moab and and Amnon were brothers Mm -hmm. and they were born of Lot. Mm -hmm. So also cousins. That's Deuteronomy 219 for anyone who wants to look me up. And in the passage, what's interesting in the passage in Deuteronomy, it specifically says God gave Edom their, their land, he gave Moab their land, and he gave the Ammonites their land. So don't, this is why you shouldn't try to take it away from them. Mm-hmm. It was a gift from the one true God. Right. So um, the, the thing is, when, when Jephthah is talking to the king of Amnon, instead of saying, hey, God gave you our land, he, he skips right over that part. And he goes right to the section of Deuteronomy that talks about the Amorite king. And he, he kind of, he, he holds up these three nations. He says, we sent messengers to them. They, they wouldn't let us go through. Mm-hmm. And he, he's making a, this case that when we send messengers and ask people for permission, then we need to be respected. You need to respect God's permission. God's um, assurance that we should go through or you know, God's ability to allow us to go through this land in peace and not deny us this right to go through the land because we are family. Right. And so he's setting all this up. But the thing is, when he skips from Edom to Moab and he goes to the Amorite king, the Amorite king, actually, his response was to attack Israel. Mm-hmm. So Jephthah's saying two out, of, two out of three times when we sent messengers, they got it right. Yeah. One time they didn't. Who do you want to be? Now, he's not coming right out and saying this, but I mean, it's, it's kind of covert and, and under the radar. Yeah. And at the same time, like I said, he's, he's bypassed Amnon as a nation completely. Right. So. Okay. So that's, uh, that, I, that, that is kind of interesting. I hadn't read it that way, but go ahead. I, I just kind of basically got the gist of it and the bits that I was reading. Go well, ahead. If, you, if you just read what's in Judges... You don't see that. You've got to go back to Deuteronomy 2. And you've sure. got, to, got to read that in, in concert with what's going on in Judges and realize that Jephthah is manipulating the script. Mm-hmm. He's manipulating history. Now, the thing, the, what's really interesting here is the fact that in this manipulation, he's saying, hey, you tried to bluff me by thinking I didn't know my history. I'm going to come back with another bluff that says you don't know your history. Right. And so he's really putting the king of Amnon on the spot. And he's also saying, hey, you know, you weren't even here when we arrived. Your, your country w- was not in this land when that you're trying to claim now mm-hmm. wasn't even yours. It belonged to the, Am- um, the Moabites. Right. So you're a liar. Yeah. Without calling him a liar. And so when 
And he's also saying, hey, we defeated the Amorites that um, we sent the messengers to to get this this um, to try to go through their land. Mm -hmm. Don't make the same mistake. The other thing is we have the only time we have a record that Moses sent messengers was to eat them. Okay. So he may be including a fabrication. We don't know. I mean, the, the Deuteronomy account does not say anything about sending messengers. Uh, to, 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 Moab to Moab or, or the Amorites. Amorites. Okay. Yeah. So, like I said, very political. Yeah. And then it gets even more mixed up. Because Jephthah, he, he is really, like I said, he's manipulating the truth to, to get the message out he wants. And this is verse 24. And see if you hear what I hear here. Will you not possess what Chemosh, the God, your God, gives you to possess? And all the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. That's okay. <laughs> that verse, that one did jump out at me quite a bit because I, I can see, and I'm not, I can't remember, we talked a little bit about this last night, but I can't mm-hmm. remember exactly what your reading on it was. But there, there are a couple ways that I think you can, a couple ways you, that you can read this. And I think you mentioned that a lot of scholars are, saying his theology is wrong for acknowledging that the existence of other gods. Yeah. And I didn't read it that way. What I, the way that I read it was there's two ways that I could see if, if you're looking at either one was like this defiant, like, like, um, basically Jephthah saying, well, your God is nothing and whatever he can give you, that's what you're going to have. <laughs> right. Cause a God that is nothing can give you nothing. Yeah. It, it, so go ahead. No, well, I mean, basically he's saying your God possesses, but our God dispossesses is pretty much what he, he's, there's this implied threat. Okay. Yeah, you may have it, but our God can take it. Well, and, and something, okay, so and the, the other way that I read it was, was kind of like, well, your, whatever your God, if your God's big enough to hold on to it, mm-hmm. that's what you're going to have. Pretty much. And, and so, yeah, so still kind of that same kind of threat idea, I yeah. guess, in all three of those, uh, something else I, I want to, I find interesting is, you know, he starts out talking about God gave, God gave everyone their bits of land. Mm-hmm. And then if you, if you look a little bit farther here, um, you have the Ammonites are now worshiping Shemesh, Chemish. Actually, that's and, another problem, but go on with and, your and, Well, and what I'm, no, what I'm saying here is that. Is that if you look at what's happened here is maybe God gave them that land, but then they started worshiping it and basically dedicating the land to another God. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that's the problem of why they're getting driven out. Yes. And we're actually going to come back around to that because I've got some stuff that's going to build on that beautifully. But the, the problem that is forefront right here, if just on the most basic level of reading, the Ammonites didn't worship Chemosh. Okay. The, the Moabites did. And so this is causing, uh, again, huge problem with commentators. Why in the world would he bring up the Moabites? So I, I dug down, did a little research on, on Chemosh because he's. I mean, I mean would, it, would it be that, <laughs> would it be basically that he's saying that it's another way, it's another way of him stating that they stole it from the Moabites? And, then, and, and yes, the, like, like this was, you know, if you want to talk about whose land it is, well, it was supposed to be uh, for Chamash or Chemosh, or mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but <laughs> yeah. Chamash. Um, and, and it, you took it from him. Yeah, that's exactly and what so, they're saying. Say, so you're saying, basically, this other God's letting you stay here, mm-hmm. but whatever Yahweh's able to pry out of his hands, we're going to take. <laughs> oh, that's exactly what it is. And it, it's funny to me that. You know, the, okay, this is a good illustration to have just thinking through the Bible and not getting too caught up um, with, uh, you know, all the semantics and everything. You, like, you can think through that and you can mm-hmm. see the solution to that without any major formal training. Where a lot of commentators have spent like paragraph after, after paragraph explaining why he might say this and then they come back to this conclusion. And it's like, seriously, it's right there if you apply some logic. Well, and that's, that's what got me in trouble in algebra class. I could see the answer, but I was terrible at showing my work. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, thought, I thought we need to look at some, some of who Chemosh was. Um, honestly, there's not a whole lot of information known about him. Um, okay. 
we do have a handful of biblical references, Numbers 21 and uh, chapter 21, verse 29, Jeremiah 48, 46. And it specifically says the Moabites are the people of Chemish. That's, that's basically all it says. Uh, 2 Kings 23, 13, Josiah destroys the high places of Chemish. Uh, 1 Kings eleven seven has an interesting story that um, Solomon had built high places for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountains east of Jerusalem. So we're being confirmed that Chemosh is not the god of the, the Ammonites, but okay. of the Moabites. But the, I'm sorry, the story, the interesting story is in 2 Kings, and it recounts this, this battle between King Jehoshaphat Mm-hmm. And the king of Judah at that time, yep. and Mesha, the king of Moab, and now there's no, there's no direct mention of Chemosh there, but what we do have, we have something known as the Mesha Stella, which is a stone that has the story carved in it from the Moabite point of view. Nice, yeah, and it's been it was found on a high place, and it records the same battle. And it records this as a holy war between Chemish and Yahweh. Okay. And so um, in 2 Kings, we're told that Mesha actually sacrifices his son on the wall. And then the wrath of, uh, the wrath of Chemish is, fe- is felt against, is released against Israel at this point. And nowhere else do we have a God fighting on behalf of a foreign nation the same way Yahweh fights for his people. Mm-hmm. And so it's a very interesting account. Now, Chemish's name has been removed from the narrative, but we still have this, this clash of gods mm-hmm. fighting over the, this, um, this piece of land. And the reason why the name is, is removed, it's the same reason that the commentators have a hard time with Jephthah actually using the name of, of Chemish because you, you're moving away from acknowledging foreign gods by the time you get to second kings right and so and acknowledging that they actually have power and so it's it's good for us to actually go back and think about the fact that these gods were considered powerful they did have the ability Mm -hmm. to fight for their for their nation um chemish is um very warlike and i think that's preserved in that that second king's account where Mesha is sacrificing his son, that he is going to be a god of great wrath. Matter of fact, when the Greeks come in, he becomes identified with Ares, the god sure. of war. So if you've studied any Greek mythology, that tells you what his personality is. Okay. So, um, you know, the, this kind of gives us some major problems that we have to work out with the judges text because we know Chemish did not give the land mm-hmm. and we know that the, the Ammonite God is not Chemish. So we've got, you know, how, how do we answer this? And I think you already did. And I think that a lot of commentators have a problem with it because they don't want to bring that divine council worldview into it. That where the, the world was divided according to the sons of God. Mm-hmm. Well, it, you know, and it, it is, it is very interesting how much easier the text becomes mm-hmm. when you when you see that as the uh, you know when you you know take the Bible seriously for when mm-hmm. it says things when it how it addresses uh, beings in the other realm whether they be gods or angels but using that term Elohim to talk about other entities mm-hmm. that and and the and you know and again you take the Bible seriously in the fact that even if you're if you're not ready to accept that, you know, God actually wanted it to say that because it's maybe true, but that at least that the writer had that in mind mm-hmm. and that that's what the writer's theology was. Yeah. Then you can really look at it and go, oh, it makes a whole lot more sense. And it's not, it's not totally disturbing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't go up, shake your worldview because you still recognize God as the one true high God mm-hmm, mm-hmm. while allowing you to recognize what these people, how they viewed things. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the, that's exactly it. You know, Yahweh is the one true high God. There's no other like him. You know, the, the right. Bible states that. And, you know, if we are using scripture as our authority and, and that's the thing I, I think, I, I do think, I had kind of been moving towards 
I didn't have the vocabulary for like the divine council, Deuteronomy right. 32 worldview, um, until I started listening to, to Heiser. And I think he gave that a great mm-hmm. uh, vocabulary for me to, to use, to talk about it. And, but I, I know that I had stumbled on this idea of, of the Jewish people believing other gods existed, mm-hmm. um, but not worshiping them. Um, I think I first came across that idea in, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but I think it was Cahill's Gifts of the mm-hmm. Jews. Um, that it was, that was, um, I, I mean, w- when I, I'm trying to articulate, so, so when I came across Heiser's work, um, when I say came across, when you basically, <laughs> when you told me to listen, like, hey, we've listened to this podcast. Um, when you told me to, to listen to him and I did, it wasn't jarring for me to hear it. It was actually like... It was relief. <laughs> it was. It was. It's like, okay, this ties that together in a way that's well-researched, mm-hmm. in a way that's articulate, and, and in a way that is biblical. Mm-hmm. Um, it, again, because if, if you look at the, the passages, I mean, you don't have to do... And my, my thing is, when it comes to interpreting scripture, it's... It's not. It's the way that requires the least uh, mental contortion, right? Is and is probably is the correct probably way. Probably <laughs> better, and and it does. Whenever you whenever it's like that key that you know you're mm-hmm. like kind of lining up the the bits on the combination, you know, and it's like you get that one in place, and it and it opens up so many passages to to make them make sense. Well, and what I'm finding, and I think this is interesting as we're going through Judges, the only parts that are really confusing or have been really confusing are those places where we, we start getting these people going into political speak. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. And when, when people start um, trying to manipulate the facts and where I had to go back and take this apart and look at what really happened versus, versus what he was saying. Mm-hmm. When we're dealing with the rest of the Bible, like you said, if you just read it for what's there and stop trying to impose your worldview on it, then all of a sudden it, it can be understood. Yeah. And so, but I, I think really this speech in particular, I, it boils down to, and I kind of reworded this, so I'm just going to re- read what I wrote. Okay. Uh, he, he says, okay, so you conquered Moab and their fear God of war is now on your side. But keep in mind, even though Moabites knew that Chemosh was no match for Yahweh, you'd better be as smart as Balak was and stay away. That, that's kind of <laughs> what I think it boils down to, because the Moabites never directly attacked Israel. So that, that was your paraphrase. That was my paraphrase. Said. Yes, yeah. that was not. Yeah. It, they, what they wound up doing, it goes back to that story of Balaam. And we may just at some point have to go back and just, we keep referencing the story of Balaam. I know, it's so weird. And you, yeah, well, it, it's a story that carries through to Revelation. And sure. so it's, it's a foundational story. And basically that's the king of Moab called for Balak and said, hey, let's seduce these men or give me a plan. First he says, let's curse Israel. Then he's like, give me a plan for how to overthrow Israel. And they managed to get Israel to destroy themselves. And so they had to use these covert means in order to have any kind of victory. Mm -hmm. And um, that's Numbers 21 through 23, I believe, if you want to look that up uh, to actually get a a fuller view. I just don't want to get too far into it here. Right. So, but he's, he's basically saying the Moabites had Chemosh on their side and they didn't win. Right. Who were you? You, you aren't, you're nothing. As a matter of fact, that even the fact that if you notice the king of Amnon does not have a name. Right. He, he refuses to even give him a name. So that's, that's an insult in this culture. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so yeah, like he's saying, you know, Chemish was, was their God and he couldn't protect them. Mm-hmm. He's not even your God. Yeah. And he, so why would he, why would he take care of you? Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so a long way to get there. And then he, he makes this mention of 300 years. And so 300 years, the, 300 years ago, the Amorites lived there. So again, you weren't even here. This wasn't even your land. We mm-hmm. won the land from the Amorites. And if it was your land, then why the heck did you wait 300 years to say anything about it? Right, right. Uh, so in the end, what he winds up doing, it, where the king of Amnon came with them and says, you, you took our land and you need to give it back. 
he flips it and he says, this is our land and you're trying to take what our God gave us. So Mm -hmm. you're the one who's sinning against us. We did not sin against you. And he wraps this all up by placing the outcome in the battle of the battle in Yahweh's hands. Uh, he says that God will judge between the nations. Yeah. Which. I mean, that that echoes or foreshadows, I guess, rather the uh, what Elijah and the prophets of Baal mm-hmm. uh, type of speech. Uh, reminds us of Gideon's father. Rem- yeah, it reminds us of Gideon's father. It reminds us of the plagues of Egypt and the battle there that mm-hmm. happened between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's, it's just, it, it reverberates. Yeah, well, and it all comes down to this one thing. God is the one who gives land. Mm-hmm. And Jephthah, it, he's, he's holding on to that truth. Which, and, and I'm sorry, and that, and that echoes back to, to Babel. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it it's tied together so well. I, that's it's, r- it's ridiculous. Well, and that's why you've got to know all the stories so you can see the, the interconnections. And if you only know a couple of stories and you know them pulled out of context, you aren't going to see this. And right. that's the reason why, I mean, sometimes I feel like I belabor some of the more boring portions of the book. But I, <laughs> you don't have to shake your head yes at that. Well, I didn't mean to not. I was... <laughs> I was, I was actively listening, <laughs> trying but, to. But I, it, the, the things that come out of that is, are these points of connection? Because, I mean, nobody likes a political speech. I don't know. Well, I know I do know people who actively listen to political speeches. Uh, I fall asleep during them. But so I have a tendency, even my Bible, to skip over them. So I kind of have to force myself to, like, dig down in mm. this. But um. What we're seeing here is Jephthah's whole claim is something very universal at this point, that that wars are won according to the might of the God, not the might of the army. And of course, we've already seen that with so many of the judges. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see it again with with Samson and his ability to to fight the Philistines. And the the understanding that these, these wars were actually cosmic conflicts and the earthly struggle well, that's just a manifestation. It's just the fallout. Yeah. It's really not even significant. It's, it's has no real bearing on the outcome because it doesn't matter who the humans participating are one little bit. It just matters whose God is greatest. And you know, Jephthah is really making the statement of faith here. And he's saying, you know, God gave us land and he's going to help us maintain this land. Mm-hmm. And this is probably why he's included in Hebrews 11, 32 and 33, because it can't be based on what's getting ready to happen, because I, I think everybody knows that there's this horrifying event in Jephthah's life yeah. that's on the horizon. Uh, it can't even be based on his own character, because we're going to see his character is so severely flawed. Right. It really is about faith. Mm-hmm. And, and he's making the statement of faith. And I think it's hard for us to, to hang on to that in light of the horror of, of what happens. Right. Because this first part of the story, we always forget. We're like, here's the setup. He just won a battle. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. That's all. <laughs> Pretty like, much. That's, oh, sorry. I'm getting a little loud. But that's, <laughs> that's generally the summary. That's generally what we hear of this first part. We just hear that summary so that we can mm-hmm. go into the part that bothers everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. You actually need this to understand why this event becomes so horrific. Jephthah has just recounted over 300 years of history to the Ammonite king. Mm -hmm. He's, he's told this guy, I know my cultures and my nation's history. Now, if you know anything about the history of the nation of Israel, you know about their religion. Right. You know about their laws. So one of the defenses of Jephthah is, oh, he didn't know any better. Well, he has just demonstrated that's not true. Right. He, right. he knows better. And this is why the last half of, that, of his, this chapter becomes so disturbing, because we can't make a convincing excuse for him. Right. And, and so, not, and the thing is, too... When you look at it, not only does he know the history of his nation, he knows it so well that he can manipulate it into serving his political purposes. Right. And so 
again, I mean, another little warning there, just because you know your Bible doesn't mean you're trustworthy. Right, right. <laughs> so. Especially if you're involved in politics. Right. Wait, I'm, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I mean, that's, but generally speaking. Well, I mean. It's just hard not to say that. No, political leaders, I mean, okay, we, since, since you brought it up, political leaders since the beginning of time, and this, this is a demonstration of this, have used scripture to validate their agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to accept that just because they use scripture doesn't mean that they're using scripture correctly or that that gives them any kind of validation for their agenda that it may not be in keeping with God's word. It may not be in keeping with God's desire. And, you know, again, we're not going to go and name names about politicians, specific political movements that are currently happening. But I think, you know, we can look back at some of the things that were done in medieval Europe and mm -hmm. definitely see how this has worked out. And, you know, religion was not the cause of those acts of violence. Religion was the excuse. Right. right. So. Well, and yeah. And. And and I, I really I don't understand how people can can I, I personally I can't I can't really I have a hard time taking any politician seriously who uses the Bible in their speech. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, how are we going to rely on the politician to have the, the correct understanding <laughs> when we can't even we can barely trust a large number of preachers to to have a correct understanding and that's sad i mean it, it, but it unfortunately mm -hmm. it's true and i'm not saying i have it all figured out I, but I, but i feel like i'm trying well and i think that's for me that's it if i see somebody who is in a position of leadership are they exhibiting a desire to know more and to take that knowledge deeper uh because i don't think they have to have uh, all the answers in order to be trusted but they need to show a desire to want to know more and to know more correctly than what they had at a previous time. So, okay, now that we've um, violated the politics rule. Uh, I know, we keep doing that. Well, it's hard not to in this book, because this whole book, I did not realize how much it is about politics. So we're moving into the um, second half of this chapter, and this is like the most hotly debated passage of the Old Testament out there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you Google Jephthah's daughter, you're going to get thousands upon thousands of results, thousands upon thousands of opinions. Um, so we're going to add one more. We're going to add one more. Uh, At least one more. Well, you know, I'm going to kind of build off some other people's opinions. Um, and mostly I'm going to go back to the text and, and show you what it actually says. But every attempt possible has been made to try to make this passage fit into the, the narrative because we have this judge of Israel, somebody who has, uh, you know, the spirit of God's been upon him in battle and helped him win this great battle, who makes this horrible vow that he's going to murder his daughter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get more specific about what that looks like, but nobody wants a judge of Israel to be this evil. Right. And that's the problem. So we, we try to figure out some way to soften the story and make it look pretty so that we can be okay with it. And it doesn't work. I'm just going to state that up front. Okay. So, and we, we particularly as Christians have a problem because he is remembered in Hebrews 11. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we, what, how can God celebrate this guy who does something so, so horrible? Well, you know, okay. So kind of goes... <laughs> I, and I know we've been saying this all throughout the study. This is not a book of heroes. No, it's God's not. the hero of the story in this book, mm -hmm. in, in every book of the Bible. But it, it, so there's that. So it's kind of the have no heroes thing. But it's also, I don't remember when we talked. I think I think it was a, was it the Patreon special. We talked about anti heroes. Uh, uh, for it was a commentarians. Yeah. Okay. So so um, I, what I think. What I think is kind of interesting is we talked about in the, the, the anti-hero revolution uh, of entertainment is mm -hmm. that we want an anti-hero because we, we want to 
we want to feel like there's hope for us. Right. And so if it, if people can love the anti-hero character, mm-hmm. if, they, if he can have fans, if he can have a story of redemption, yeah, then maybe we can have a story of redemption. Right. And I kind of feel like that's part of what we need to look at here is like God celebrated his faith. Mm-hmm. In not Hebrews, his works. Not his works. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not saying we should just sit around on our laurels and do absolutely nothing because James talks counter to that, but he talks intention with it. Well, (laughs) yes, intention. Yes. That's, that's more accurate. But when we look at this, we can look at these people and say, they're not heroes. I'm not a hero. Mm -hmm. There's hope for me. God can work with this to achieve his purposes. Mm -hmm. And what was his purpose was to bring the Messiah. Yeah. Pretty good purpose, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm uh, for it. I'm please, a fan. <laughs> please note my my deliberate understatement. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but if God can use these people to bring about the most holy person in history, yeah. I hope none of us have done what Jephthah did right? or is about to do, or <laughs> in the narrative. Mm-hmm. But you know, then then he can he can use us for something mm-hmm. and that should, that should get us excited. Um, he, he can, he can have a job for us to do. Right. Well, and, and that's, that's the thing. I think Jephthah really stands out as somebody who had great faith in God's ability, mm. but he got caught up in the cultural ideas of what serving God was supposed to look like. Right. And again, another warning uh, to us that I think we should take from the scripture, the cultural ideas of what God is, who God is and how to serve him may not be correct. And that's mm-hmm. why we have to come back to the scripture. Mm-hmm. And for Jephthah, that would have been the Torah. It would have been the first five books of that Bible. And he, he would have had at least some sort of access to the basic principles in that book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and it, that even, that idea gets even more pronounced when we get to Gideon and his mother and father uh, not Gideon, Sa- Samson and his mother and father. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, this, this whole book is about, do you know your history? Mm-hmm. Do you know what God actually said? And are you going to be faithful to what he said, or are you going to bow to peer pressure? Yeah, so I think, I think, I think we also have, uh, there's a little bit of a warning here, I guess, in the book about building your whole theology on just a tiny bit of scripture. Right, I because mean, they do apply, he does, he applies part of the Torah fanatically right but he ignores other parts of the torah yep and so i think that yes that's a very good point and that again we're seeing that as something that happens in today's culture and we see cults built on them we see fringe churches uh that pop up and say hey we've we've got the truth that nobody else is paying attention to Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so this, this happens and it has been happening and so Maybe one of the warnings we take away is don't do that. Well, yeah. And <laughs> talking about fringe cults and, 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 and it's, it's not even like we have the truth that no one's paying attention to. The most of them are saying we have the truth that no one else can even see. And that's when you really get dangerous. Oh yeah. So. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I so will, don't do that. I will pull you out of this ditch that you're getting ready to fall into. <laughs> so. The problem with Jeff's story, like I said, it's very hotly debated. Um, mostly it's debated among uh, academics. It's debated with Bible critics. Uh, it's not something we in the church tend to talk about too much uh, because it is an uncomfortable story. And it's an uncomfortable story because unlike Gideon, where we can stop the story after the victory, mm-hmm. Jephthah's folly is wrapped up in the victory. Right. And as a matter of fact, the victory becomes what gets us. It's the vehicle that moves us to exposing his flaws as a person. Sure. So in verse 29, the spirit of the Lord's upon Jephthah, and he makes this tour through Israel. And and we're presuming that this tour, most scholars do that, um, is to gather troops. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is standard practice. And, um, but there's no mention of God speaking. There's no mention of God showing up. You know, this is somebody that the people have chosen to lead them. Yeah. And it's, it, it's almost like God's showing up because Jephthah does have faith, but he's not really seeming to approve of their choice because he isn't, you know, when Gideon started to have doubts, God sent him into the camp to hear mm-hmm. the dream. 
Right. And God's not doing anything to, to reassure Jephthah. Right. Now, you got to remember who Jephthah is. He's an outcast. He's been driven from his own home. So I think there's this level of, of doubts going on that maybe God doesn't accept him, even though he has his faith. And mm-hmm. so what do you do when you want a God to accept you? Well, if you look at ancient Canaanite religion, you offer, offer them a bribe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, and that's funny because if if anyone was listening to the most recent episode of Commentarians, mm-hmm. Doug uh, Doug mentioned that because uh, y'all watched the Frighteners, yes, and it's out, so I'll go ahead and say it. Yeah, you know? um, but the I, I don't remember where where the conver- where in the conversation it was, but he was talking about how when people interact with spirits, that's what they try to do. They try to bargain and mm-hmm. offer bribes, and he 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 brought up Jephthah as a uh huh as an example of that, that you, you, you're not going to bribe God. Right. It, it doesn't work. And, and this is a yeah, perfect example of this because, and when you listen to Jeff, this speech with God and in this, in this oath, you, you do have to remember that conversation with the King of Amnon and that he is a negotiation negotiator. Mm-hmm. He, he's very good with his words. And, you know, he's basically saying, God, if you give me victory, I'm going to give you something in return. And this the language is very much in keeping with other Canaanite vows that we've found in inscriptions and different uh, records. So we, mm-hmm. we know that he, he's behaving like a Canaanite towards God. You can't be a Canaanite and engage with God. Right. You, you have to be an Israelite at this point. And now I'm not saying that you had to be born into the Israelite nation or the nation of Israel. You had to have that heart. Mm-hmm. You, and mm-hmm. that, that's the main thing. And we're going to see examples in scripture, and we already have with Rahab, um, that outsiders and Caleb and Othniel, the, if yeah. you have the heart, then God will accept you. But if, and you are considered part of that covenant community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so um, he says, and I'm just going to read what the verse says. This is uh, 30 and 31. If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the, from the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the Ammonite shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So that's, that's his statement. And then we know that he goes on and he, he attacks, God wins the battles. There's See, almost, this is, this is usually where we start the story of right. Jephthah when we tell it. That's what I was talking about earlier. It's like, eh, there, there was tension. Then there was a battle. He won. And now he's got to fulfill the vow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and the thing is, the, there's no real details about this battle moving forward because we, we don't care. We know God's going to win. Jephthah's already been, um, he's made that statement of faith. Mm-hmm. We, we should follow him with that. Um, the battles, it, we don't care. Like I said, we don't care about it. We want to get back to this oath that he's making. And so his daughter comes out to meet him with tambourines and dancing and the text makes it very clear that she's an only child, which you picked up on. I personally, as someone who reads a lot of stuff, I'm, this is, I am joking about this, but I can't not say it because it's funny to me. So as someone who spends a lot of time in the worship leader groups, I think this is um, a great warning for people who uh, show up with tambourine without asking first. <laughs> I I could be wrong in my ex Jesus there. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm bringing something to the text. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit, but um, you know. Sorry we, we've for all our seen dark sense of humor. Um, <laughs> it's a family trait. So anyway, <laughs> pray but, for our deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what this story is about. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, well, but I was going to say you actually what you picked up on that was actually correct with that phrase "only child." <laughs> I'm making a theological point here and you're just <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So yeah. So the only child uh, connects her back obviously to Isaac. Yeah. And we're, we're going to go into how the story connects, um, but we're not going to get there just yet. But Jephthah's response. And so I just want to go through the rest of the story and then we can come back and pick it apart. So Jephthah's response is victim blaming straight up victim blaming. Yeah. Uh, alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low. It, literally, you brought me to my knees. Yeah, and- that, that was okay. Yeah, that was something I noticed when when I read through it was that <laughs> he doesn't take responsibility for being the one who made the stupid vow to begin. None. With. 
gun. He's like, and, you caused great trouble to me. <laughs> and also, what did he expect to come out of his gate when he comes back from a battle? Did, right. I mean, did you just have kind of like free range chickens. Uh, the neighbor he didn't like. I, yeah. Somebody who owed money to. What's what's the deal here? Yeah. The chickens. I, I'm very curious. Um, did he did his livestock just I mean, did he just the livestock I, ran up and greeted him? I don't. I don't know. Well, Did okay. he have a favorite dog? <laughs> no, he didn't. I guess you wouldn't keep dogs in yeah. that culture. You wouldn't have had a dog. You know, Elsie the cow didn't come out to meet him. Somebody just wandering out the house to like, you know, a kid to catch a bug wouldn't have qualified. Um, it would it had to be to, to meet him. him. Yeah. Yeah. And so and you know, okay, here's where we as Christians and even a lot of Jewish commentators who want to make him prettier say, Oh, well. You know, they kept livestock in their house, so he was probably expecting it to... Okay. No. Livestock doesn't come to greet you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's just not how it works. And really, this is one place, this is an excellent verse to show how commentators, I mean, it's not commentators, translators reveal their bias. Mm -hmm. Because it is perfectly acceptable to translate the Hebrew as whoever or whatever. And most translations say whatever. But it can also be whoever. And he says, I will offer him or it. Also perfectly acceptable. Um, the words can, can work either way. So you as a translator have to decide, are we going to say that he's, going, he's intending to offer a person? Or are we going to imply that he might be willing to offer something else up? Well, and, I mean, I realize his daughter. So, I mean, was he... Is it possible since he was the leader over the people at this point? Was he living in a really nice house? Did he have advisors who lived in the house? Did he have servants? You know, so yeah, yeah, I, that's my thing. It's like, who was he expecting to come out? I think no matter what, he was expecting a person. I don't think he expected it to be his daughter because he says to meet me. That's the tipping point for me. The scripture says, whoever comes to meet me. Mm -hmm. Now, and now I do find it interesting um, because. One of the one I did hear in a sermon that there was uh, that where he grew up, the land of to, was it Tobe, Tove, Tove. Uh, yeah, he yeah. went to the well. That's where he was living with the worthless men. Yeah, mm -hmm. that in that land he would have been outside of, uh, I guess Hebrew jurisdiction, if you will, mm -hmm. and the the people of that land, it, human sacrifice was a common practice in that land. So I don't yeah. know how much validity there is to that. Uh, but I did hear that in, in one sermon at one it's point. It's not unthinkable, honestly. It, sure. I, I mean, it's definitely a possibility. I would have to research more to say absolutely. Um, but the, like I said, for me, the, the, the tipping point is, is the fact that she, it's to meet him. And then his daughter comes out with this overwhelming intent to meet him. Right. And so it, it's almost like God kind of orchestrated this moment where, okay, you've set the condition. I'm going to make sure the condition is fulfilled. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, it's, um, it's the, it's the whole, uh, CS Lewis thing. God ultimately gives us what we want. Yeah. Um, kind of idea. Yeah. And so, yeah. It, and it's, I mean, and that's what makes this, this story so crazy is because he, there's grief there, and I think the grief is covered by the angry response, the victim blaming. I think it hurt him, mm -hmm. and so I think it came out, you know, we've all done it. It you know, came out as, as denial. Yeah. I, that kind of... Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what's going on here, because he, he does seem to care for her. Um, but I, I, the problem we have is we don't want to think that one of God's chosen people could actually do this. Well, yeah. Well, and here's the thing: what was what was he chosen to do? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think again, mm -hmm. I think we we conflate oftentimes the salvific election and the having being elected to a purpose. Well, and did God even choose him? That's the other question. Or did God Fair allow enough. the the people of Gilead to to get what they deserved? I mean, we're right back to Jotham's story. You, people get the leader they deserve, and leaders get the people they deserve. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is that when you get a prophetic word, it doesn't just apply to one situation. It has a ripple effect throughout time. Yeah. And God has never spoken to Jephthah. 
God has never uh, appeared to him. He Jephthah just stepped into the situation. And when God said, hey, I'm going to shut up and be quiet over here and do my own thing while you continue to act like fools. Mm -hmm. The people got Jephthah to come in and and play the savior. And I think the the only reason I mean, and this is my speculation, I think the only reason why Jephthah is. um, it, It has that position of judge is because he made that statement of faith. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. so he kind of put God on the spot. And I mean, literally, you can't do it. But at the same time, I think God kind of bows to our human perception. If, if at that point, if the Ammonites had succeeded after Jephthah's words, then it would seem like Chemosh was stronger. It would seem like Moloch was stronger. Mm-hmm. And so Jephthah really, he, he called out the truth. And then God said, yes, I will uphold the truth. Yeah. And so I don't know if he if he necessarily was the chosen judge by God. Okay. I, 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 that and, makes sense. I, yeah. Well, just... you know, when we're, we're taught this kind of divine determinism that this would be the person that God 100 percent chose and he he groomed for the situation. Then we have a really big theological problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now we're going to have to face that problem, with Samson. There's not going to be any way around it, right? But at the same time, I, I don't think that's the problem here. I think the problem is that Jephthah is very much a product of his culture, and he's upholding the standards of his culture, and he's doing it under the guise of, "Hey, I'm one of God's chosen." Yeah, yeah, and, using the old religi- religiosity. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that that just it doesn't work. So, I mean, in, in this story, there's so many connections to other stories, and we haven't even had a chance to get into those. And yeah, but I, that's we're going to talk about how this plays out. And I think there's actually connections to the book of Enoch. Okay. And so I can't wait to get into those. So, but do we want to go a few minutes longer or we um, want to say we're a little shorter than we usually okay. are? So, we but, can, I mean, but we're, we're, let's go through the rest of the story and then we can come back and pick it apart next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the daughter, when she comes out to meet him and, you know, he, he bewails this thing. He does the victim blaming stuff that we were just talking about. It. Uh, she accepts her fate. Mm-hmm. There, there's absolutely no arguing, no negotiating. Uh, she doesn't even scold him. Right. Uh, she just acknowledges that he's made a vow that to God and it's got to be fulfilled. I mean, which, okay. I don't, not to get picking it apart <laughs> too much this week, but I mean, if they were living in a land where human sacrifice was normal, then it wouldn't be a question for us. Yeah. yeah. This, Let's do it. Yeah. And, and I think we forget that life. Um, I realize she probably wasn't that casual, but go ahead. Well, the, the text almost presents it like it is. And, you know, and she does. I mean, she, now she does ask for one thing mm-hmm. and she asks for two months to go into the woods with her friends to mourn her virginity. Mm-hmm. Very interesting thing there. Why, why two months? Right. Why to mourn her virginity? Now, uh, that's, that's where a lot of Christians have said, oh, well, and I say Christians, it it's, goes back to Jewish commentators too. She was not offered as a sacrifice. She was offered as a living sacrifice to work in the temple, maybe making tapestries or braiding wicks or, or what have maybe you. Maybe the tabernacle, probably the, not the temple. Sorry, this, this is correct. Yes, you are right. <laughs> and so, and, and Jephthah, he, he allows her to go, um, but you kind of wonder, well, I guess she, in some ways it's a bit of a question. Why didn't she want to stay with her family? Why would she rather go out with her friends instead of, I mean, of course, dad's just said he's going to kill her. So I can, I guess that kind of makes sense, but <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so I'm going to hang out with not you for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but the problem with that is, is verse 39. Um, the, it specifically says, at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did according to his vow that he had made. And the writer specifically tells us exactly what the vow was, and that's to offer a burnt sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So um, that's, that's the thing that... He, the author really can't bring himself to, to even say the words he, he, he offered her. He, he just says, no, he did what he'd vowed. Mm-hmm. So I don't think we can soften the story. Now, I used to think we could, and I wanted to. Well, who wouldn't want to soften this story? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, 
It's not pleasant. It's it's a horrible story. And I think this is one of the reasons why critics of the Bibles like to, likes to use it. Um, and what's interesting here is in offering his daughter his only child, Jephthah cuts off his legacy. Mm-hmm. Because in ancient Judaism, the way to ensure eternal life was to be remembered. And mm-hmm. that's the reason why we have all these genealogies and all these long list of family lines so that you're remembered. Mm-hmm. By killing his only child, he erased himself from that. And she actually becomes the one who's remembered. Because every year, the, the daughters of Israel go out for four days to mourn for her. Mm-hmm. And so to have a woman who rises to prominence at this point, it is almost unheard of that there would be this celebration for her life and kind of a national holiday. Yes, it's in remembrance and mourning at first, but, you know, I think like a lot of holidays we have today for uh, people who have gone before, like, you know, Martin Luther King Day, you know, there's still that element, yes, we're sorry he died in such a horrible way, but at the same time, there's this celebration of what his life meant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so... She really does become that that heroine of of the story. And Jephthah, yeah, he won a battle, mm-hmm. but he's this awful, horrible person. And yeah. that's how we remember him. And then and that's the reason why when we go back and we find the book of Hebrews and we find his name among all these other heroes of faith, you just have to stop and go, what's going on here? Yep. And so, so we'll get into that next week and kind of pick that apart and see yeah <laughs> see what we can make of this horrible mess yeah so anyway well everyone thanks for tuning in um we are glad to have you i'm glad to be back in the recording mm-hmm. in the studio we're doing some stuff so um excuse me um, if you like what you heard please uh like and share the page um mm-hmm. check us out on patreon if you want some more stuff um we are uh we're not always completely on schedule uh, with the specials, <laughs> but whenever we miss a month, we try to do at least two extras to get you caught up. Um, there's also, I put some outtakes in there. Uh, oh, did so, you? <laughs> yeah. So there's some of that. Um, it's kind of goofy. Um, but we are excited to have all the people who have been supporting us. Mm-hmm. Um, this, uh, this actually, this episode will come out one day before uh, one year. So, oh, it's this episode. Yeah, this episode, yeah, <laughs> awesome. This will come out on the twenty first, and our first episode was on the twenty second of October. So we are, we've managed to do this for a year. <laughs> yeah, we managed to do this for a year now. So, um, I think that's great, and I'm excited. Thank you, everyone, for for contributing, helping make it possible for sharing. Um, if you want to see more of it, keep to keep going. Uh, please continue to support us by liking and sharing. Sharing. Yeah, it's probably the easiest way to help us out. Absolutely. And leave us a comment. Give us a thumbs up on mm-hmm. uh, YouTube. Uh, leave us a review on iTunes. All of these things help. And, you know, it's just a few minutes. Yep. And I, I know I hate doing it, too, but it really is. It It's going to help us reach more people. And we hope mm-hmm. that we're creating something that you want to share with others. Yep. So. And so that being said, thank you. Uh, this last year has been really cool um, seeing some of the feedback to to different questions that we've brought out, uh, being mm-hmm. able to, to examine some of those answers and interact with some of you in the paddle store. Um, so I, I've had a great time and we hope you have too. And so we'll like, great year and let's try to do another one. Sounds so. like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks again, everyone. We will see you next week. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the faith and other oddities podcast, a Raven Creek social club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.